This is a great comment and I want to address it because I think there's a number of things in it that are really important as we move forward. The commenter says, why don't you give it up? It's true and always will be despite your roundabout ways of trying to disprove it. Spend your time receiving its spiritual messages of Christ. So let's break this down just a little bit. Firstly, it's true. The Book of Mormon is true. What does that mean? Does it mean that it is factual, that it is an account of ancient people in the Americas, that it's the forerunners of the Native Americans? Is it because it's powerful and it means something to people, that it's, that it's deeply held within their hearts? Does that make it true? What are the basis for which we determine something is accurate and worthwhile and sacred. The word true is used a lot when actually what we might be saying is it's really important to me, that it, I feel deeply about it, that my beliefs are centered on it, that that feels true. And that's a, a great way of interpreting truth or at least understanding it from your own perspective. But that's not very objective, that's incredibly subjective. So in that sense, you might use the word sacred to me rather than true. Another way to think about that is the idea of truth being accurate or reliable or repeatable. And in this case, if we're looking at that in terms of the Book of Mormon, those are really good questions to ask. And that's actually what I'm trying to suggest through these videos is we are adults. So we should be able to understand what the Book of Mormon actually means, what its limitations are, what its beauty is perhaps, but also, you know, what we can rely on. And so that's really the kind of things that I'm trying to explore in these videos. I'm not here to disprove the Book of Mormon, but I can show that it's not historic, it's not ancient, and it's probably much more linked to Joseph and his 19th century environment than we have otherwise looked at properly. And when we do it in that context, there are some things that we can learn that I think are really important, especially as adults trying to understand what it is that the Book of Mormon can mean. The last part of this person's comment is around receiving the spiritual message of Christ. And I think that's really important because week 13 of the Come Follow Me talks about Easter and Christ's role in the Book of Mormon. And so we should have a look at this as a particular thing. What is Christ's role in the Book of Mormon? What can we learn from it? What are its limitations? And does the Book of Mormon add to our understanding of Christ? And I think those are really good questions to ask and answer. And so I'll do that in this series uh, coming up. As we explore Jesus in the Book of Mormon for Come Follow Me week 13, it's really important to understand how much Jesus is in the Book of Mormon. 2 Nephi 25:26 is a common verse used to talk about how much Christ is involved in the Book of Mormon. And we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Now on the surface this seems like an incredibly amazing thing. The Book of Mormon talks about Jesus so much, it's embedded in everything it does. And that should be something that we celebrate and excited about and that could tell the world what an incredible person Jesus is and how much he's involved in the history of the world. The problem with this is this is not history. This is claimed as being in 600 BC by Nephi on the Americas. And this just is not part of what we understand about the history of the world or the history of Christianity. The Book of Mormon knows more about Jesus Christ, even his name, according to 2 Nephi 25, 19, than any other book in 600 BC, any other writing from the Old Testament or the Torah or anything. And a huge problem is the Book of Mormon preserves an early 19th century American Protestant understanding of Jesus that simply did not exist in the first century AD or at this time period with Nephi in 600 BC. The Book of Mormon goes on to describe Jesus in very specific ideas, things that are only in the New Testament, things that are dependent on the New Testament. We don't have any information about Jesus other than what you could find in the New Testament then being relayed in the Book of Mormon. Details about Jesus' life, 
about his family, even his mother's name, um, and also describing Isaiah passages as being about Jesus. Isaiah chapters that we know weren't written till much later than 600 BC and could not have been acquired by Nephi. So the information that's in the Book of Mormon about Jesus Christ is anachronistic for the time period, but it's totally in keeping with the 19th century environment that Joseph was in, and that was written into the Book of Mormon at that particular time. The Book of Mormon is dependent on the New Testament to talk about Jesus Christ and the events in his life, and not the other way around. We don't use the Book of Mormon to inform us about Christ other than what is in the Bible. This makes the Book of Mormon look like biblical fan fiction, not history. It means that any scholar of the Bible can't take the Book of Mormon seriously. The next thing to explore with regard to Christ and the Book of Mormon is the idea that it is anachronistic to LDS teachings. The Book of Mormon reflects a 19th century Protestant understanding of God as a trinity, or more specifically, modalism. Mosiah chapter 15 spells this out. God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And they are God, yea, even the eternal Father of heaven and earth. Joseph Smith in 1829, when the Book of Mormon was written, believed in a composite God. A God that had different modes. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, who were one God. Jesus Christ was the very eternal father because they were the same. And this is spelled out again and again in the Book of Mormon. The Son of God is the very eternal father. Even in First Nephi, where there are several occasions where the Son of was added to various verses to make them less Trinitarian, because by 1837, when these changes were made, Joseph had changed his position on the nature of God. But in the original 1830 version, it said, the Lamb of God, even the very eternal Father. The three witnesses even attested to this. The honour be to the Father and the Son and to the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. Second Nephi, the only and true doctrine of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. Mormon chapter 7, unto the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, which are one God. Doctrine and Covenants 20, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are one God, infinite and eternal, without end. Amen. This is also reflected in many passages from the Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible that he did in 1831. But by 1835, Joseph recognized God and Jesus as separate people, and we see this in the evolution of his first vision. And then, of course, later in Nauvoo, we see an evolution to many gods and an understanding that God and Jesus Christ are separate individuals who have tangible bodies separate from each other and that the Holy Ghost is a personage of spirit separate from them as well. So the Jesus Christ of the Book of Mormon is completely anachronistic to the teachings of the current Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But it is completely in keeping with the early 19th century Protestant American understanding of Christ and his relationship to God. And what Joseph believed in 1829. The crowning event of the Book of Mormon is that Jesus comes to the Americas. And so what are his teachings? How does that compare to the Bible? In chapter 12 of 3rd Nephi, Jesus gives a sermon. It's called the Sermon at the Temple. And it mirrors the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5 is known as the Beatitudes. And of course, there is another sermon too. It's called the Sermon on the Plains, which is in Luke chapter 6. And the things that you will notice right away is that Luke chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 5 are from a similar source. They're obviously pulling from a combined kind of an idea, and we don't have that source. In biblical studies, it's known as Q which means that there are earlier writings on this subject which we do not have now access to, which makes it curious that the 3rd Nephi chapter 12 example mirrors almost exactly the Matthew chapter 5 passages. Let's just consider how difficult this would be to accomplish because Jesus spoke Aramaic and then his words were turned into presumably Greek and then translated into English. 
in the Book of Mormon, the people spoke Hebrew, so Jesus probably spoke Hebrew, and then this was turned into Reformed Egyptian, which then was turned into English. The idea that these two pathways would lead to the same text is impossible. The verses in 3rd Nephi chapter 12 are dependent on a King James version of Matthew chapter 5. And where they do differ, like in verse 6 where the understanding is that those who are hungering and thirsting will be filled with the Holy Ghost, that is still dependent on the New Testament version. And there are some oddities. Verse 26 in Matthew chapter 5 talks about a farthing, which is an English monetary term. Verse 26 in 3rd Nephi 12 uses the word C9, which is a Nephite monetary term. But the problem is, verse 41 in both Matthew chapter 5 and 3rd Nephi chapter 12 use the measure of a mile. And of course, we all know that the ancient Americans used kilometers. This shows Joseph Smith as the author because he changed farthing because it was an English monetary term, but he didn't change mile because it was an American measurement. The people of the Americas did not measure in miles. They would not have known what this term was, and because it wasn't spelled out in any way previous in the text like the monetary system was, there was nothing that could be changed over for it. So there's a huge problem here. The words of Christ when he comes to visit the Americas is dependent on a King James version of the New Testament, not on some ancient words that Christ might have spoken to a parallel group of people. We should talk about how problematic Christ's visit is actually in the Book of Mormon in 3rd Nephi. We've just gone through how Matthew chapter 5 is just copied into chapter 12 of 3rd Nephi. This continues with Matthew chapter 6 and this continues with Matthew chapter 6 in chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 7 in chapter 14. Chapter 15 talks about other sheep from John chapter 10. Chapter 16 continues that theme and also references Micah chapter 5. Chapter 17 talks about Christ doing miraculous things in the Americas, but these things cannot be written. Chapter 18 talks about the sacrament remembrance from Matthew chapter 26. Chapter 19 talks about the calling of, a, of 12 disciples of Christ, mirroring the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. And curiously, you've got Timothy, which is a very Greek name, ending up in the Book of Mormon. In chapter 20, Jesus quotes Micah chapter 5 again, and also talks about how the Gentiles are being given the blessing of the Americas, and that the Nephites are going to be scourged and scattered by them. We've already talked about this because it comes up in 1st and 2nd Nephi, but the idea that the Lamanites, the Native American people, this is their destiny because they've been wicked. But here Jesus also says that if the Gentiles don't accept the gospel, that then the Lamanites, the Native Americans, will be the mechanism by which they will be destroyed. In chapter 21, Jesus talks about this great and marvellous work, which is the Book of Mormon coming forth. And he also talks about Joseph Smith, and this becomes more explicit into Nephi. Chapter 22 is just Isaiah, chapter 54. And chapter 23 is interesting because Jesus says that Isaiah is really special and you search them. Jesus does not seem to know that Nephi has written a whole lot of Isaiah into his books. And this is because they haven't been written yet. Chapter 24 is just Malachi chapter 3, and Jesus at this point doesn't seem to know that Malachi is a Hebrew word for messenger, because there is no identifiable name for that book in the Old Testament. And chapter 25 is just Malachi chapter 4. In chapter 26, Jesus identifies all these incredible, amazing, wonderful things from the beginning of time through to the very end. But Mormon explains that he's forbidden to write them, that, he, that God's going to test the faith of people before he reveals this information. And so it's not there. Chapter 27 seems to be an add-on because Jesus seems to have finished, but then he appears to his disciples again and helps them with the contention about the name of the church, which he tells them should be the Church of Christ. That's all we have from Jesus' visit to the Americas. A lot of New Testament scriptures, sometimes whole chapters, and a lot of Old Testament scriptures, sometimes old, whole chapters.
the stuff that is unique to the Americas is so special and so sacred that it has been forbidden to be written and so you don't know what it is. Consequently, 3 Nephi is wholly dependent on the King James Version Bible and it doesn't give you anything else that you couldn't have already got from that. This seems crazy because the crowning event of Jesus coming to the Americas should yield us more information and greater information and different information than is in the New and Old Testaments and it just does not. The Book of Mormon Jesus gives us nothing that you can't already find from the Bible, suggesting that the Book of Mormon is dependent on a King James Version of the Bible, not that it is an independent work of a different parallel community who believed in Jesus.